Welcome, Spartans, to Halo TV Plus, part of Evolved, your home for Halo. I am your host, Oren, and on Halo TV Plus, my guest and I recap Halo's original television show, Halo the Series, and we discuss its contents and unique canon within the Silver Timeline. Joining me tonight for Episode 3 of Season 2 of Visigrod is Steve. Welcome back to the show, Steve. Hey, I'm excited to be here today. Yeah, man. So you helped us kick off uh, this kind of Season 2 preview episodes, and now you're here with, uh, with us doing one of the episodes. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, I didn't get to do episodes the first time around. I don't think I was here for the first season, so I'm super hyped for this one. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty nice. It's it's really good. I I enjoy maybe a little selfishly, but it's just kind of how the show's structured. Just talking to a different person each week, and kind of getting their take as as the season progresses. And uh, and yeah, this is nice. We're we're one week after our double episode premiere, and I can I can feel the creep now of just like oh, just I can't wait till next week's episode to see more and all this kind of stuff. We got a little spoiled with our double feature last week. Yeah, it was it was definitely a heavy hit right out of the gate. It was a long stretch to get here, um, but it, it was nice. I was happy to get two at once. Yeah, it, it'll be yeah, and it, since it's only eight episodes, I'm I'm hoping it kind of just keeps moving, um, and especially with uh, with episode four. But we'll we'll get to that when we get to that. It's gonna go so fast. It it is gonna go fast. I think once it picks up, it's it's gonna go. Uh, but, uh, but this is episode three, Visigrod. If you're a returning listener, then you know this, but if you're just now joining us, Halo TV Plus produces two podcast episodes to accompany each Halo the Series television episodes. This is the commentary episode where in a moment, Steve and I will watch Visigrod and discuss the events as they unfold on screen. We encourage you to watch along with us. If you haven't watched the episode yet, we recommend that you watch it before listening and watching along as we often spoil scenes uh, while they happen and even before they happen. Tomorrow, we will release our analysis episode that will dive a little into a little bit more detail as well as some predictions for characters and scenes in this episode. Additionally, if you're new to the show, welcome. Halo TV Plus is part of Evolve that hosts a variety of other Halo-related podcasts like Podcast Evolved, HCS Pro Talk, Mission Debrief, Builds with Blocks, and Halo Book Club. You can learn more about each of those shows on our website, EvolvedHalo.com. Evolved hosts another show called I Would Have Been Your Podcast, which is a Patreon-exclusive podcast for our subscribed patrons. If you're not a patron and want to learn more, you can head over to Patreon.com slash Halo Evolved. Patrons receive a variety of other exclusive rewards, such as early episodes, access to our original 18-song soundtrack, unique swag, and access to our private Discord channel, and more. Shout out to all of our current subscribers. Thank you guys so, so much for your continued support every single month and every single week. Uh, we're very pleased to give you guys the content that we're able to provide. I have a quick little announcement before we dive right in. Starting on Tuesday, February 20th to Tuesday, February 27th, Halo Infinite's ultimate reward will be Vanek's helmet for, I think, any of your Spartan cores. As well as his visor color, uh, which you just earn by logging in. It, Kai and Riz, they've already had their helmets being featured as the ultimate reward for this current sort of like season cycle or or what are they calling it? Mission cycle? Content cycle, I guess. Con- content cycle. There, there's, um, yeah, like our operation cycle, I guess. And they 343 has said that they are looking at ways for players to acquire old rewards and they're looking at the spartan point system from master chief collection and so that might come into the game in the relatively near future or sometime in the not too distant future so if you miss those helmets that's probably an avenue that you'd be able to re or not reacquire but just acquire and uh and yeah but you still have vanix and i wanted to put that out there now so then people can kind of make plans to get that ultimate reward because by the way we do our episode releases it's kind of on the tail end of their reset so uh yeah steve do you want to take us away on what happened last week with the second episode sword and listeners i recommend getting the episode queued up because we will start watching after this yeah so last week 
or well, last week we had both episodes, but on the second episode, we got a bunch of Dr. Halsey being held prisoner in some sort of hollow room, and we find out that it's Ackerson that's holding her. Um, she's kind of being psychologically tortured by the flash clone that comes in and helps serve her and like be friendly to her and keep her company. It's just a girl named Julia that's been playing backgammon with her. Um, we have Riz dealing with her injury that she got at the end of the last season. Chief's trying to push her hard cause he knows what's coming and she's not looking too good. They're, they're kind of doing this, uh, homage to the Ring the Bell from Fall of Reach, where they're dealing with a bit of an obstacle course and shooting at each other, and she's trying to climb up and hit this sort of beacon that's up in a rock face of sorts. And she almost makes it, and Chief sees her struggling. He can take a shot, but he decides not to because he wants to see her work for it, and she doesn't. So she's dealing with a bunch of issues from that. We get Quan again, of course. <laughs> you know, we, we we just can't seem to get away from that, but I get it. You know, things are things are looking better for Quan this season. She's dealing with being hunted down. She's some sort of indentured servant and is not having that life. She is not about it. I don't know what rules they have to deal with there, but she's like, you know what? I'm 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 just not living this life anymore. Screw these guys. We get Ackerson and Kai talking about Chief behind his back. You know, there's still that question of Chief's uh, stability, so to speak. We've got Ackerson pushing his propaganda, but also questioning it behind the scenes. And he's trying to get Kai to, to turn Chief. Be like, hey, he's not doing too hot. Well, we should take him off the lines. But she she's loyal to him. She doesn't throw him quite under the bus. We get Chief meeting with Perez trying to get her to open up about what happened on Sanctuary because he knows she kept her mouth shut, and that's part of what's helping Ackerson push his propaganda. We know that at the end of the episode, the Covenant sent a small force. We're assuming it's a small force. That's where we got McKee returning, and they took... It was the large artifact they took, right? Well, I think it's a little ambiguous as to if they took it or not, but... I you would, I guess, imply that they did take it before they would then attack the planet, but yeah, I mean, they they somehow found the location of the large one at the bottom of Sword Base, and it, that kind of is the final stinger that uh, McKee is looking at the larger artifact. Yeah, McKee's there with one elite, and they're obviously not fighting anybody actively. There's nobody putting up any sort of resistance, and they're like, oh hey, the artifact, so. We can probably safely assume they're in possession of it, but yeah, we haven't seen them get the smaller one. We know the smaller one is at Fleetcom, where Ackerson is asking Cortana the odds of something, and she says it was ninety-seven point something percent. Did you get the point? It's in a previous document, I'm sure. But yeah, it's it's okay. basically ninety ninety seven point. It was it was like ninety eight percent. It may as well, for all argument's sake, it was ninety eight percent. Yeah, that 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 outcome would have would happen soon, which I think we assume is the covenant finding reach. And I think that's pretty much all of the threads we had hanging that are dangling into this week's episode. Yeah, so we we didn't see any new bits from Soren. We still have yet to see Miranda Keys going into episode three. And it's just kind of what's what's going on. And then also the chief, oh, I've, I didn't put this in the notes, but chief also is trying to get in touch with Cobalt team to see what they're doing and notices that they went to a relay, the Visegrad relay on reach and did not leave the planet. And they don't know where they are. They're listed as standby. And so he takes it upon himself to lead Silver Team to go investigate because he just has a bad feeling about it all. And that's where the episode ends and where episode three picks up pretty quickly. And I actually took a poll in our community on our Twitter X page asking, going into this next episode, do we think Cobalt's going to be alive or dead when we next encounter them? And we got like 
26 results of people tapping in with their opinion and it was 35 65 alive or dead so most people thought they're gonna turn up dead at some point but it wasn't a landslide so let's keep that in mind going into this episode yeah so all right well we'll go ahead and and get started and watch the episode uh i have mine queued up here i can then count us down if uh if you're ready to go for it steve I'm all locked and loaded. All right, listeners at home, uh, prepare your play button. I will count us down and say play, and that's when you would play with us. And we'll sync it up as best as we can. Uh, Steve and I are not watching with commercials, so if you are a viewer that subscribed to a commercial or ad-based service for Paramount+, Plus, then you'll have to pause our episode when the ads play on your screen. Uh, But without any further ado, five... Four, three, two, one, play. So we are starting with the recap. You just gave us our recap, but kind of generally speaking, how would you respond to this episode? Did you enjoy it? Did you leave wanting more? Did you think it was not great? Kind of where do you fall with the the, the second episode, Sword? Um, I know there was a lot of dialogue that happened between the first and second episode there's a lot of things that need to be set up for this season so that way they can throw a lot of action at us real fast it's a tv show it can't be constant action all the time i get that i'm pretty realistic about it but the way they built up slowly in the second episode and then in those last 10 five minutes everything just got set up really fast and it's like okay episode three shit's gonna happen yeah i kind of thought that it was a good balance between episode two and episode one of like we got our action and then we got our setup and i kind of was feeling that if if they kind of kept doing that so to speak then it would be you know relatively okay they kind of flip flop you know a heavy episode and a lighter episode and it, yeah, I think it, it ended on a pretty good cliffhanger, and I feel like they've really sold the like, okay, we're not trusting Chief, we're trying to gaslight Chief and and not believe what he's doing, and Ackerson's the new man in charge. We have these other Spartans, and I feel like it it has done the will the world building that I think it kind of needs to to where now we can just kind of get to the meat and potatoes of the story. Uh, it's kind of how I felt with uh, episode two. I feel like it 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 was a nice way to just kind of finish the all right now now we're here so to speak yeah from from the end of two going into three we've pretty much grabbed all of our loose hanging subplots and side plot threads from the end of season one and we're bringing them into the fold you know they're, they're, no one's going to magically just flip a switch and we're going to be running perfectly parallel to core canon but they're obviously trying to walk it back to be more in line with it and They slow rolled it, but it's working so far. You know, we'll see how it keeps going. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, no, I I definitely agree. We'll kind of see how it goes. I I think the the setup, the first two episodes are have really done a good job of like being kind of core canon adjacent, whereas like season one was definitely kind of really on its own in some regards. And even kind of going into this episode, since now we're starting to get into it with Silver Team here on the sort of as- outskirts of Visegrad or the Grizz of Visegrad Relay, uh, it's like, oh, well, this is kind of nice that it's like this is basically Noble Team going to investigate the, the relay going down and kind of going on. And, and so we're, we're more core canon adjacent this go around that I definitely think is a much stronger direction because they're still able to change things that they need to change to make it unique and within its own timeline but you're still closely adjacent to what you know fans and people who know of the franchise as core canon so it's kind of appeasing you know both boxes so i'd say like yeah like the first five to seven minutes of this episode i was like super excited because it was like this is this is kind of what we're getting into uh and then that kind of quickly goes away as we'll see in a little bit but yeah at this point they can they can still tell the story that 
the longtime Halo fans know while still changing up a bit of it to be surprising to us and still keep things making somewhat sense for newcomers. Yeah, like I don't think we need like a noble team or anything because we have Cobalt team to a degree, but I mean Silver team could just kind of be noble team. Just, you know, they're the ones doing the stuff cuz we know who they are. I think a huge deciding factor in that also has to be the fact that we're dealing with eight episode seasons. Yes. Yeah, that much is yeah. You just can't develop too many more. I mean even with Cobalt team, like we got a little bit of glimpse of them from episode 1. And that's really all that we've gotten to them from like a character point of view. We do see them again later in this episode, and unfortunately, they're not in a you know in a position for us to really learn more about them. But you, that's just kind of how the nature of it is. Like this is a TV show about this one Spartan fire team, Silver Team, and we follow them as they. It's all still a Master Chief story. Yeah. So at the end of the day, yeah, very much so. I think maybe if it was like a twelve or 16 episode season of some sorts they might have been able to do some sort of proper noble team parallel yeah maybe so yeah there's just so much they can they can just go that like as soon like even they're even juggling multiple storylines right now between the rubble between Ackerson stuff and uh silver team and some of the other characters like they have all these threads that they're trying to weave and even that's a little like kind of bordering the line of unruly or kind of hard to follow so like to introduce a whole nother spartan company and to do stuff in tandem with that would just kind of just be a whole nother thing that they'd have to do and i think it just doesn't quite translate as well to just 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 insert silver team into all of these other spartan companies and then weave your story into all the different stories that you want to tell in the tv show which up to this moment is kind of what we thought we were getting, right? I mean, yeah, we're, no, we're I definitely was like, now. okay, yeah, I was, I was like, I was all strapped and buckled in, and I'm like, okay, yeah, this is, this is what it's gonna be like. This is like kind of the end of the first mission of Halo Reach, uh, Winter Contingency, and they're gonna find some group of elites you know, tampering with the system or whatever. And then that's just going to erase the alarm. Like I wasn't expecting like the fall of reach to like start, but I was, I was thinking this would be like a a little engagement that was going to happen. And then out of nowhere, these random ass Marines just show up. Yeah. We we thought it was going to be the, uh, the pebble that started the avalanche, but not quite. No. Yeah. It's just like, it completely, what's the word what'd you say bait and switch yeah yeah it was a bait and switch it just was like oh and we also get this kind of interesting cutting back and forth with Perez which we don't really ever address until the very end of the episode which I guess we'll talk about that then but but yeah I was like I literally was watching this I was like what the heck is going on who is this man like right here it was like oh no nothing burger why I was like Oh, she has priority orders from fleet. Like, who are you, lady? Like, you're not wearing any sort of identif. Like, I learned later that she was an officer, which does have uh, seniority over chief. But like, I it it just was so abrupt. I was like, what well, really? What is going on? I mean, at this point, if I see no identifying markings, I'm just assuming Oni. Because oh, it's yeah. pretty easy at this point, and we know Spartans are under Oni. Like, all right, somebody with no no tags showing up and start bossing him around. They're obviously an Oni higher up. Yeah, and, and we later we learned that that's that's actually the case because that that character I don't even know her name, Briggs maybe. She uh, she kind of knows a little bit more of what Ackerson knows, which is definitely being filtered through Fleetcom to paint a narrative. So. It's like, okay, yeah, he's, she's just another minion, I guess. Uh, but yeah, this was so upsetting that, like, we learned nothing. Like, <laughs> you know, like, they, I mean, what, what we learned later is that Cobalt team, like, got, like, injured or slaughtered, and there's just no, like, evidence of any of that. Like, they cleaned it all up. They literally wiped the place 
clean because there's no evidence of but anything. they left the plate of half eaten they, yeah they did left leave the plate of hash browns and toast or whatever yeah that was that was odd for sure i was i i immediately gave like a sigh of disappointment of like oh okay this is how it's gonna be like and like it's like we said the first two episodes did such a nice job we thought and it's like uh oh the third episode is uh is raising a different flag I do like this plot thread, though. So now we're with Ackerson, and we are with his dad that we learn. He's helping him shave. His dad is suffering from dementia, I think, or maybe some type of Alzheimer's. A little, little bit of senility. He's just he's losing it a little bit. He gets the yeah. waves here and there. And so it, this is a nice humanizing moment for Ackerson, because he, he has feelings like the rest of us. and so you He's not a villain. Moments. Yeah, he's not quote unquote a villain exactly. So it he just has to gripe with I guess these difficult scenarios and things that he deals with whatever way he feels that is the right way to do it. Uh, like he's not out is... to murder Chief and Silver Team. He's just <laughs> trying to make them look bad because he's got his own agenda to push for his own like military right. power that he's trying right. to push. But he's still a human. He's still fighting for the humans. He still has humans he cares about. They're still trying to fight on the same side of the same war. Right, right. Yeah, this is very much the, you know, yeah, show show that although he is in opposition of our heroes, he's he's still he still has a side of him that makes him human. He still has some humanity in him. So this is uh uh, yeah, I just I just really like this scene. This scene, and then there's a kind of a bookended scene towards the end of the episode that picks up after this. That's also also nice. Because I mean, I I don't remember ever reading about any of this in the books and all that. I think Ackerson was just more or less a random little character. So this is that foreshadowing moment if you've been paying attention to Halsey and him in the last episode. Yes, yes, very much so. Or Cortana, you mean? No. No. Oh, with, uh, father, uh, father, uh, asks Ackerson, where, where's his sister? Oh, for yes, okay, yes. I mean, I didn't make that connection until, uh, until he mentioned, until he said her name. I was like, oh, Julia, that's uh, very interesting. And when I first read or saw this. I just assumed maybe Ackerson has some personal, uh, like, not PTSD, but just personal pain and anxiety he has to kind of confront. And he was just flash cloning Julia as, like, a way to see her again or experience time with her and and not really what is more of the reason that she exists as a flash clone. Yeah, he has other motives for that. Yeah. Because uh, I want to move to this scene because, like, I was watching this scene and I definitely was, like, in Chief's shoes. I was like, what are you talking about? I was kind of, I was upset with Keys. I was like, are, wh- how are you not listening? Like, are you in cahoots with Ackerson? And, like, Chief even says that. And I was, I, I equally shared <laughs> Chief's frustration in this scene, which I found kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean... We do know Keys is supposed to have Chief's back. We also know he'll go behind Chief's back when the chain of command calls for it. And we know yeah, he's I mean, kind of he's got he, his hands Keys tied by Oni. Keys is one to follow the chain of command. I mean, he, we saw that last season with um, whatever the what Order seventy Article seventy two is that what it was to kill Quan. And so like he's he is complicit and has his own sort of like demons and things that he has to gripe with, but. But I just well, felt not just that. Just like, it, really? It, it was when, you know, Chief went and told Keys that he was remembering things and, and you know, what did Halsey do to him? And Keys was like, don't you worry. When the time comes, we'll, we'll confront them together. And then Keys immediately went right behind Chief's back and was like, yo, he's starting to remember shit. What do we do? We got to shut this yeah. shit down fast. Yeah, that too. Yeah. So he, he – yeah, Keys is by no means perfect. Uh but it, this this just started to seem a bit too far. But I guess it. I mean, we later learn a little bit more that I think redeems Keys a, a bit. But in this moment, though, Keys 
from what from his standpoint and what he knows, he's he he truly thinks that Chief's delusional. We, well, we've also seen Keys like really pissed a little bit more in the first season. So like here, you could see he he's torn over having to be in this position. You know, actors selling it really well that he's not just straight up losing it at Chief. He's like, oh my god, why do I have to be dressing you down? Why do I have to be pushing this position that Oni's trying to push? Yeah. And then Kai, she also, this is... Now, something that I made note here is, like, Kai as well as Vanek and Riz, I mean, they already walked out, but, like, we got two episodes already of, like, people gaslighting Chief and not believing him and all that kind of stuff, and Silver Team still basically believed him. So... I, you know, I don't know if this moment is really necessary to have Silver Team as well deny and not believe Chief and start being disgruntled with him and stuff. I mean, I think it's justified for what has happened. I just don't fully think it was, like, really needed. I feel like we got enough of the gaslighting and denial in the previous two episodes that kind of and put in the, the first point season. across that Oni is up to, up to something. So now we're back on the rubble. Yeah, now we're back on the rubble, and I, I'm i immediately like, she looks so out of place with that, with her hair. Like, I feel like she should be wearing something a little bit more discreet, or I don't know, like, she just screams so, like, high like, class. Everyone else is walking else around down there. In, in poverty fashion. Her man's is yeah. gone. He's not running the scene anymore. Like, she needs to stop walking around all high class and start trying to blend in. Yeah. I I, th- I think, and this kind of is going to talk about this whole plot line for this episode here at the Rubble in general, but just, like, I, I see what they're doing, but, like, I just don't think it was ri- written the way to make it the most engaging, because I wasn't all that engaged. I was just like, okay, I, I'm following it, I'm seeing it, but I'm, I'm now sitting there wanting to just go back to the storyline I really care about. It wasn't. It wasn't necessary, and, and that, that that's been a criticism I think from even the first episode. I kind of gave it a little bit more faith, but like I I just feel like the danger just should be more immediate because it's just like Soren's crew just playing games with with uh, Lyra, and it should it just kind of just drags. Like get on with it. Like tell me the information I want to know so I can care about you guys. I have a feeling in the back of my mind that a lot of these subplots that we don't really need per se, we're getting for like production reasons, like certain actors had contracts that called for a certain amount of screen time or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah, I could see that. Uh, Another thought that I had from a production reason since you brought it up is the fact that they probably built this set and they were like, we should use it a little bit more to get more bang for our buck instead of building some other set to tell some other scene because i i've seen that um like in the real world like working on my own tv show where or it's not my tv show but the show that i work on like they'll they'll tweak or change scenes to or like we'll have like one scene at this one location that we build and it's like well if we add another scene or two here and cut this other scene, then we can save money because we can just film it at this thing that we're already going to invest money into. And uh, that's kind of what I see when you look at how large the rubble is and like Soren's and Lyra's uh, home here. And like even downtown, like uh, reach that we get later in this episode that we also got in episode one, like they're definitely building these sets and reusing them so they can, get the most out of their use uh, for multiple episodes. I mean, I can absolutely see them reusing plenty of the rubble sets as like ship interiors, especially because they could have built the sets to look like that in the first place. Like, okay, we use broken up ships to build the rubble and then just redress that set a little bit. If we need covenant ship interior or what yeah. have you make it all purple. Well, I think I think in a general sense, yes, but I feel like a Covenant ship, I mean, I think I saw on a thing that they actually eventually do go on a Covenant ship, and that's like a whole build-up of itself to get that aesthetic. Oh, yeah, for sure. 
regardless. Sure. This also gave me Captain America Winter Soldier vibes. Oh, in the yeah. Elevator. I don't know if you it's had like, that. Why? <laughs> like, why? the moment he stepped in there, I was just like, oh, hey, Cap. <laughs> like, he hit the guys, and I was like, yeah, that's a pretty clear homage there. All right, so now we get homeboy blind spartan washout which yeah, i'm already was... questioning like come on man they got all this technology all these medical advances and they can't deal with the blindness i mean i kind of buy that i mean because they were augmented eyes. in some way like i mean I, I, that, that, I don't have a gripe with that i kind of have a gripe with the fact that they've now established that these two characters lewis and this healer are now a a couple because like i I don't know. I just thought it was a little odd because the because Lewis was like when I found that maybe I misinterpreted the scene, but I got the sense that like the guy cooking, I don't even know his name, is like some sort of like mystic or healer or acupuncture or just some sort of like therapist. And it's like, yeah, this guy helped me with you know through my troubles and my uh, my uh, mental states and things like that. And I was like, oh, and then now you can help Riz. But then now it's like, oh, well now they're like. Boyfriend, well, boyfriend, I mean, how many so. how many uh, patients end up falling with like their nurse or their doctor or whatever? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's true. I just I was this just dude was little... at like a rock bottom point in his life, looking for a purpose. I I could see it. I I I, I guess I could see it. It just was a little off. I don't understand why it was word. necessary to to. Have. Yeah, I guess that's what it is. I just didn't think it was necessary. But I get I get that they were doing. They already set the precedent for the TV show doing dinner table scenes. So, like, they're just throwing more of them at us now so they can do a lot more dialogue to set more stuff up. It's an, e- you know, it's an easy thing to do for TV. That is true. Scenes. This, Yeah, that set's much easier to pull off than, you know, you got to save your money to do your big battles, I guess. So, but I do like, just to wrap up that scene, I do like the point of the scene, which I guess is what matters at the end of the day, which is Riz going to Lewis saying, hey, a few days ago, you mentioned that there's more to life than just being a Spartan. And I I kind of like her exploring that of herself uh, to kind of just see where that takes her, especially after what just happened with Chief and the, the you know, ima- imaginary mission. It mostly just left me questioning like in the core canon, we have most of the Spartan washouts got reassigned in some way, shape, or form. And yeah. it doesn't quite seem like that's what happened with this dude over here, Lewis, or what, 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 what his name yeah, was. Yeah, his name, yeah, Lewis is he blind, Lewis. Spartan. I could have sworn they called him something else the first time we saw him. Uh, I remember Lewis and the subtitles say Lewis, so I'm going to okay. say Lewis. Maybe it was just a weird sound thing then. But yeah, I mean, they couldn't have given him cybernetic eyes or flash cloned eyes or like had him set up doing, you know, listening to to audio stuff with his but augmented also, but Spartan maybe, hearing. But maybe he didn't want to do that, you know? But that's true. Yeah, in Core Cannon, you had characters that are washouts, like Soren, for example, he, he had like a desk job for a no, while. No, Soren ran off. Well, he ran off later on because he was but but when he first washed out he uh he had like a desk job at oni doing something and then he was talking to some other character who was fighting for the insurrection and kind of brainwashed him in a way and basically convinced soren to defect the Mickey and him. then that's when he escaped and then eventually got away so but yeah, to your point, there's probably something he could have done, whether at Fleetcom or in the UNSC, to kind of continue being, you know, quote unquote Spartan or just some other type of uh, support character for the UNSC. But instead, he's not. He's kind of doing his own thing. But I mean, he's he's there, so he might be doing something. Maybe he's just like a we see Spartan. him in a gym. He's probably maybe he's some sort of physical trainer that helps a lot of the troops yeah. at best. But I mean. How much is that really like you? All I'm saying, is I feel like there's more he could have been doing. But I, I would argue that since he, the way he's talking to Riz is that he's very happy with where he is and that he's oh, yeah, found no, that sure. purpose. So 
yeah, I guess he could be doing more, but for him, this is enough. So, uh, so now, now we're with Quan and uh, Liara again, and I, I like this scene because of just purely what is being talked about. Like, I like that Quan is she has some guilt that she's dealing with because this is finally like the the first moment this entire season that we really get to know what happened to Quan between the two seasons. I just think this whole scene is just completely out of place. Like I feel like it should just like I feel like they inserted in there because they needed to. We could like, have assumed everything that they said and didn't need them to confirm it. Well, we didn't need them to spend X amount of minutes of screen time to have this little bit of dialogue for us to go, okay, yeah, Quan lost everything. Madrigal got blown up. They already told us Madrigal got glassed. Like, she, but it was like, okay it, it's just like I wanted to just know like the next thing that she was going to say because it's like, like how did you get here? How are you in, like an assassin now? Like it like. None of none of the things just are adding up. I'm still it, wondering just, about like the assassin thing. Like, I figured, you know, obviously we know people managed to make it to the rubble on a couple of ships and what have you, and that's how they ended up into the indentured servitude. They set that up a little bit for us. But she apparently has significantly increased her combat skills between the first season and the second season. That's really yeah. the, the only major question I have about it. I just, I just have. I pieced it all together. Well, right, but like, I want to know like what her purpose is in the story now because it's it's obviously something that has to deal with the monitors and the secrets of Madrigal, but that's not going to be told to us probably till the end of the the season or like if ever. It's just every time I see Quan, it's like, all right, I want, I want to like you, but just the way your story is being told. Same thing with like Liara, like I. I want to like be engaged. Uh, I just had a weird, weird thought. What if they set her up to play the role that Miranda played in the games? Like she oh, ends up no. being a little soldier and then somehow comes through in like one of the later seasons when they would be doing Halo 2 type stuff, Halo 3 type stuff. Would you want uh, that or is that just no, a I'm not saying I would want that. It just it just hit me as like a possibility of something they could be setting up. With how many things out of left field they've thrown our way, I'm not discounting any possibilities at this point. Yeah. I mean, I think it would be incredibly odd to kind of have Liara start to I guess do more with the UNSC. Not Liara. Like, I, I mean, I like I like this moment where they they hide they steal a ship and they're trying to find Soren like I think that's good. I feel like they should have just got away instead of yeah. whatever. Like, cause like, what's the difference between this and then how we leave things? Where I guess the only difference is that we don't have Kessler because now he's somewhere else. But like, I, I just feel like it's it's just so it's strange that this this whole otherwise completely original story from the Halo universe is just so discombobulated and weak. It's like not leaning on anything. It's just forced. Yeah. It it doesn't feel natural. Yeah. Exa- yes. Exactly. It doesn't feel natural. That's that is one hundred percent the thing. It's like it's all just here for us to watch. And I, you know, since I'm watching it, I want to feel for it. I want, but I, I mean, I get that she wants to find Sorn, but like these two characters, like the goons, it's just like big yawn like it's not personal well yeah it's personal like and then i don't know (laughs) fucking quan just kills them all like i I don't know (laughs) okay but now here Uh, we go we get the answer to our our burning question yeah so this is so this is another mixed bag scene that i have because on the one hand i like it because it it's telling the audience that keys doesn't or didn't know and now he knows and he's like disgusted by it and he he questions and he kind of combats Ackerson a little bit um you talk with or you learn that the the officer there that tried to arrest chief is like complicit and like aware of all the shady shit that Ackerson is doing but what also gives me questions is like okay so 
some covenant force had the strength to defeat four Spartans, yet the presence of the covenant is still remaining completely un like secretive and unaware to the general public. And even those who are aware of it, because the UNSC and ONI are aware of it, they're just all okay with the fact that they just killed four Spartans and we're not doing anything about it. Like I just that to me was just like like what? I don't yeah, know. I, we, I, we know we know Agerson's trying to push his own agenda, but at one point do red flags start going off in other points of Oni in the UNSC. I, I feel like I feel like Visegrad like this episode, I mean we'll see what happens either in the next episode or later in the show. But like I'm I'm wondering what would have happened if we introduced the Spartan the threes like now, basically, where it's like, okay, the covenant are on reach. Like we need to mobilize. We need to get an attack. Like it, it doesn't need to be all out construction or destruction. Like episode four is probably going to be like, you can have small battles and you can, you can have, uh, keys and Akerson. Like, okay, these are, you know, basically what Halo Wars two and Halo Wars is. It's like there's these tiny little engagements, and we're gonna plan, and we're gonna attack here, and then we're gonna mobilize and attack here. It's like that's what I thought this episode was gonna be like. And you don't need to show so much of the Covenant. You can keep it to just that opening scene, and then you know, oh, we just got slaughtered at this you know command post Echo, and it's like okay, well they got slaughtered there. How do we regroup and like? I feel like he can introduce the Spartan threes here and start showing a little bit more like resistance because I'm on Key's side in this scene where it's like, so what, we're just not going to fight? And he goes, well, we are going to fight, but we're going to lose. And it's like, well, why aren't we fighting now? It's just, it's just a weird scene to me that does a little bit, but also doesn't do enough. They're obviously trying to express the sentiment that we got from the books when they were setting up the Spartan threes initially, where... They were kind of a throwaway suicide bomber type force that was just meant to buy humanity time. But they did a very poor job of explaining it here. Like, we know what they're trying to say because we know the the original lore very well. We get the subtext, but, like, they just don't do a good job spelling it out for everybody else or, like, making it flow smoothly and cohesively. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Like, I don't, I, I think I'm trying to think about the showrunners and the writers to see like how they are doing it. And I guess they're just going to explain that all later, whether it's the next episode or not. But I I feel like it just would have been stronger. Like that would have been the perfect scene to for Ackerson to just lay out his hand and be like, all right, keys, this is what's going on. I need you on my, on my side. I need you in my corner. Like he asks that, like he should play his whole hand to convince him and it's like we have we have these new spartans they're gonna they're gonna help and we're gonna evacuate the city but we can't do it just yet we're not ready or you know we're finalizing the final thing or katana cortana is doing this last computing or you, you could say whatever it is to to kind of justify the delay but just the kind of withholding information is what this show is doing a lot about and it's just frustrating because it's like you want they're me to care about out of us yeah, it's just like you, you want me to care about X, Y, or Z and you're trying to do something, but you're like deliberately leaving information out of the viewer to be, be to be knowledgeable of that it just just doesn't add up. There's not enough substance to go with the suspense to prevent fatigue from it all. Yeah. And I think and that's my main issue with like the Quan and Rubble storyline, and I'm starting to get like that with Ackerson, because now we've had three episodes where we as core canon people know what's happening and it's like okay i i i get i have the foundation i'm ready for the payoff but they just keep gaslighting and building and building and building and it's like you don't you don't need all of that or i don't know maybe maybe i'm maybe because i already know what's going to happen maybe i am able to piece it together a little bit more clearly than the average viewer maybe that's something that i never considered I don't think so. I think as as core canon fans, we know the big picture that's already painted in the core canon universe, and we can see the same colors and where they're using them here in this. But in the time that they're taking to stretch it out for people who don't get it, they're also not doing a very good job of spelling it out quickly and cohesively and moving on. Yeah, 
No, I, I, okay, good. So it's not just me. <laughs> uh, uh, all right, where are we? So, so we, we get Parangoski again. This is where we are now. They're eating ramen. And I, again, started questioning Parangoski because she started saying something like, you need to listen to Oni because if you don't listen to Oni, like they'll, they'll, what do they say? I, I wrote it down in my notes here, and I think we already passed the scene. Oh, she says she says something about when you cease to be useful. And I was just, like, thinking to myself while watching this. I was like, well, yeah, but, like, you were sacked, and so now you're a civilian. You cease to be useful. Why didn't Oni kill you or get rid of you? I literally brought this up on the first episode recording. We talked about it. Like, she knows so much. And then we get the learn. Then, then it turns, and we get the big reveal that she's actually just again uh duping chief and she's still actually working for oni and i was just like okay all right so this is also just kind of a nothing scene that just again oh yeah everyone's just out and after chief what 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 else is new and it means we're gonna either have questions that don't go answered or they're gonna spend a bunch of time later on that could be spent on reach falling battle stuff to explain how she seemingly got kicked out of Oni and went all undercover just to mess with Chief? Or, like, is she working for Ackerson or with Ackerson? Or does Oni know that Ackerson has something going on, so they're playing their own side game? Like, now there's all sorts of other weird threads dangling. You know what would be very interesting is the next episode. So, like, if... We have all of these threads. This might be an analysis question. Let me hold on. I think I'm going to save this. But basically, what I'm trying to say is be interesting to see who survives the next episode. But I think I'm going to save that conversation for our analysis episode because it's a lot of speculating. And I think just from a writing point of view, it's a very interesting conversation. So I'm going to save that one. Um, So don't let me forget. Uh, But So now we're here back with Ackerson and Halsey. And again, Halsey seems very irritated because she's left, like you said, in this mind prism uh, prison. And I don't uh, think she's as annoyed by being in the prison as she is. But why am I dealing with this silly, stupid man? I should be out there doing science. What is this bullshit? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. This isn't going to last long. I'm going to get out of here eventually. Why? Oh, why must I tolerate this nonsense? Yeah. She's like already like she's no doubt been thinking about her escape and she's just like I'm just so ready to get out of here and I mean I don't even know what Halsey wants to do like she's on the run like does she I guess she wants to learn more about the artifacts or try to solve humanity but it's just I'm I'm kind of happy that like she's supposedly going to get freed cuz like with the fall of Reach happening, something's going to happen. The holodeck's going to break down, and then she's going to have so They're not going to kill Halsey off with the fall of Reach, plain and simple. No, we all no, no, know no. it. So it's like, it's just how is she going to get out of it and go do crazy Halsey shit? Yeah, she needs to do more Halsey shit. That's, that, no, that's true. She needs to... That's but exactly then what again, she needs to do. Halsey just chilling in prison for a while is also like a core part of the <laughs> canon. Like so much of it is she's chilling in prison. Just why am I dealing with this bullshit? <laughs> you know, and you're she right. She breaks that's, out and goes really and does wild scientist rebel shit and then back sitting in prison again. So, so they nailed it. Okay, give, give the writers credit for that. <laughs> that's, the, that's the most accurate part of the season so far, is keeping Halsey in prison. That's funny. Uh, that said, I, I do like this conversation. So th- this is where we learned that Julia was selected oh, so to be good. part of the Spartan 2 program, was flash cloned, kidnapped, and uh, and then I, I guess she died to Ackerson, you know, Ackerson knew that she died just like the other Flash clones did. But I take it that Ackerson already knows what Halsey is telling him. She's more so just telling it for the audience, but she, but, but Julia doesn't survive the augmentation process and just dies, just kind of blankly. I think she knows he knows, but what's more important is the way that he just very very not so subtly teased to her and sort of the audience the spartan threes if that is the way we're gonna go because he was talking to her 
about, you know, you are a part of something much bigger than yourself. Your Spartans are yeah. part of something much bigger. The Spartan twos lead to the Spartan threes. And he made it this yeah. very pointed comment that he finished off with because he thought it was going to be this really nasty fucking sting. So she turns around and does her little explanation of his sister to him, but she mirrors the exact same thing that he told yeah. her and throws it right back in his face, except makes it much more personal about his sister. And it was her little super smart Halsey conversation. Fuck you. Moment. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was yeah, that was great. And yeah, that was you nailed it on the head. And then we get the reveal. The big yeah, the reveal. So uh, which again, which is we kind of also talking about Kurt on how Kurt was kind of like abducted and then sent to kind of train Spartan 3s to where in in the silver timeline here, Akerson has now basically captured Soren, abducted him and then put him with Halsey. Now I'm interested in to to think about what Ackerson's overall plan was. Like, did he just assume that the two of them would just be in the hollow deck and then eventually just die when the fall of Reach happens, or does he still have some grand purpose or grand plan for them? I think he either could be trying to do the Kurt setup. He's got two major pieces of the Spartan program here. Uh, a Spartan two that knows his shit that's not currently assigned or on record, so to speak, already listed as MIA. He's got Halsey that created the Spartan twos and her mind available, so to speak. So he could go that route or he could just be, you know, doing the TV drama of let's just stick them together and see if they kill each other. <laughs> Or he could just be leaving them behind to die when Reach falls. But I think I think he's going to go on ahead and see if he can't set up to use them both. TV Ackerson seems like he thinks he's smarter than Halsey. Yeah. Okay. So this scene is silly, uh, but... So we we come back to a conversation that Soren and Liara had in episode one where she was talking to him, to Soren, about, like, treating his crew better and, like, what he did with the magical money. And Soren himself says that, like, it really wasn't that much. It was just, like, a box of of deuterium money. And it it really didn't go that far. And, uh, And she was like, well, your people don't know that. And he's like, well, so what if they do? And so now this scene is all about... This is the so what. Yeah. And he wants him to hand over the money. And, like, this guy is, like, trying to boss his crew around because he's now the new captain. You hang out with a bunch of thugs and start bragging about how much money you hauled in that you didn't share with the homies. And then thugs are going to turn around and try and get it from you, not knowing that you're lying little shit and don't actually have the loot. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this whole, like, I'm not even clear, like, their total end game. Like, did they sell Soren out to someone, or were they, like, put at gunpoint, like, to sell him out? Or, like, I, I'm, I'm just so confused as to their overall desires, because from what I'm able to follow, it's just boiling down to magical money. And it's like, it really? is. It is. There's You're no doing there- all this just for that? Yeah, of, of all the stupid subplots that they're throwing at us, these particular characters are that two-dimensional. They just want the money. Where's the money, Lebowski's? Where's the money? Yeah, that's it's just it's just so disappointing. And like where's the money, Lebowski? <laughs> I don't have the money. They got the wrong Lebowski. It's also like, okay, if the money's on the rubble, like, they're in space. Like, do they have to turn around and go back to the rubble to go get it? Like, if it even existed over there? Uh, Are they even in space? I I don't know. They're just on the ship right now. Like, last we saw, the ship didn't even take off. It's like, they might just still be chilling off of the dock or just right outside the rubble. They might not have gone anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Also, when that cut just happened, I thought, like, uh, Liera was, she, like, vomited up blood. Like, I straight up thought she died. And then, like, they they cut, and then it's like, oh, it's Quan. I was like, oh, Quan just killed that guy. Oh, is Quan just an assassin now? Like, 
it like cuts to the the carnage that she's she's done and it's like i just i don't know anymore I was I was giving I was like defending her and giving her like the benefit of the doubt that like we're going to learn what's going on, but three episodes in the writers still don't know how to write Quan. Unless she just spent her entire time on Madrigal before it got glass, just training and murdering people and getting Yeah, like like the fucking killer. the woman tries to sneak up on him and Quan just turns around and stabs her. Like well, that one I got, because we didn't see anything happen to that one, and Quan's not saying anything. She's just still doing the tapping thing that she used to bait everybody else. I don't know. I, I hope now that, like, and I'll talk about more of this on the analysis, but now that it's Quan and Liera, like, there, we can finally get some, like, exposition and then some purpose with, like, what is going on but also part of me doesn't want them in the next episode because i don't want to take screen time away from the fall of reach because it sounds like they're gonna just or looks like anyway that they made cram the entire events in that one episode which i was kind of not hoping for and then we just get chief talking to nona for a minute (laughs) yeah So here's the kind of bookended scene from the beginning with uh, with Ackerson and his dad. At the time has come, which uh, is a Ackerson very Ackerson and Acker dad. Yeah, <laughs> Acker dad. It's okay. I'll sign off now. Bye. That's great. Oh man, I wish I could like rename the episode to that or something. I might have to weasel that in somewhere. Ackerson and Acker dad, and then we get Acker daughter coming in too. Okay, but here. I think we got to we gotta pay attention to this because the thing we talked about we weren't supposed to talk about. Don't let them take me alive. And today's the day. When he drops the pill, I like that actually like... Oh my God, it was so It good. hit me. That was, that was good. Just like... It was, you know what, Ackerson? You've been such a dick for these last two episodes. Fucking do it yourself. <laughs> yeah, kill your father yourself. I was like, ugh. It's like, all right, as much as, all right, we had to deal with that subplot, great, but uh, the payoff was worth it for that little bit there. Yeah, yeah. Now, these are, these, this scene and the other scene are, I think, highlights of the episode. I mean, this episode really feels like kind of like an Ackerson episode in a way. We get a lot of screen time with him, and uh, he talks with Keys, he talks with Kai. That we actually talked completely over, now that I think about it. But Well, I think this is an important part now. Because I think now, now that he's actually had to do the thing, he's done with his personal aspersions. He, like, whatever motives he had, those are going to go out the window. It's all just going to be, we have to fucking take down the covenant at whatever it is. Well, takes now, I mean, he's that, effectively leaving that. behind his entire personal life this in this moment you know he packs up all of his things in a moment we're gonna see him get on a ship he said goodbye to his dad his his sister is already gone his mother is already gone his home is gonna get destroyed like he is he is literally t- putting everything behind him to where going forward it's it's just gonna be like you said just 100 percent. we have to stop the covenant which i think you know could be interesting how they continue to play that they're wiping the slate clean of stuff we didn't care about after spending so much more time expanding on the stuff we didn't care about, <laughs> trying to make us care about it, so that way it would be stakes when they wipe the slate clean. Yeah, exactly. Which is a shame, because like, some of the stuff like we didn't need to care about. You know, like... So this is our last scene. We have Chief at church with Perez. Uh, And my issue with this scene is that she is about to tell Chief that she discovered something and translated a message from Sanctuary, but, like, doesn't tell anybody. And unless Chief, or it's not until Chief goes looking for her does she actually say something. So if Chief didn't even come here... She would have just 
been bombed when the freaking church gets blown up. You know, TV, writing, convenience. Like, why... I don't know. It, She's logic- probably still trying to just come to terms with it and, like, confirm her suspicions and translations. Maybe she just already gave up hope. Maybe she just was like, oh, I figured this out too late. We're g- I'm gonna, I know I'm going to die. I'm just going to go to church and pray. And- Last time we saw her, she was listening to it. So she probably just figured it out, and she's like, oh, my God. And she's like, I'm going to church and praying before I do anything else. Yeah, I maybe I'm just not a real an over. She probably also person. can't track him down. You know what I mean? Well, go to go to Fleetcom. Go to just I mean, I asking guess for a Spartan who is in questionable state and on punishment right now, who just escaped his security guards. Well, here we here's the city life. This is everything that's gonna get destroyed. Just I I just think of uh Terminator when they do her having the dream next to the playground, watching the people playing. <laughs> and... Vanek just get, getting a What's in the pouch? Out of his locker. <laughs> like Yeah. Is it a sandwich? Is that what you think it is? Is that going to be our poll for the community this week? What do we think? I don't is know. It? Like, what is, yeah, what's it's in just, bag? It's a, something that was wrapped up. Maybe it was, maybe it's like a rag, but it literally looked like a, a like a made sack been food. lunch. Could have been some sort of personal belonging or something. Maybe he's thinking about his his life now that he can think about his life. No, we could talk about the poll. In the next episode, I got some ideas. And then they call him out. So here's here's Ackerson leaving leaving the planet. And then we get the name of the Sanghili as well. Uh, it's not Thel the Dem. Which is good in a way. Yeah, I, it's fine. It doesn't need to be Thel. Like, just make him a menacing elite and we'll just fight him. And It would ruin back. things if it made it Thel. Yeah, hundred percent. Ah, goosebumps! Massive explosion, and cut. The, that that's the moment that came an entire episode later than it should have. Uh, yeah. We should have got well the visit grab moment, degree, yes, and then the yeah. next moment we got should have been. The shit hitting the fan, but okay. Well, it's, it's fine. like we have it now. So, like the I was talking with Aaron uh, on a previous episode before, like during our like preseason talk, and we were we were going through the episode titles, and we were talking about Reach, and I was like, oh, well, Reach is obviously going to be the, the episode where the the fall of Reach happens. But then Aaron was like, well, I think it'd be better if the fall of Reach happens over multiple episodes, much like how the game fall of yeah, Reach of happened course, over of multiple course. missions. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And and so he was like, well, you know, Sword Base can be like their response to First Contact. And then Visigrod can be the, you know, attempt to take down the, the, the Visigrod relay and then the Covenant have to face it. And then Reach is like the actual fall and I was like, oh, wow, that's that's great. That way the conflict stretched over three days. We can have tension. We can have, like, loss and small victories and defeat. But, like, from what we've just seen with these first three episodes, it's like, okay, I guess the Reach is going to be just one episode because I don't know what episode five is going to be about, Alaria. I don't even know what that's going to be. Well, I think, you know, episode four will get – now is the shit hitting the fan on Reach, but that doesn't mean it's going to be over as quick as it starts. We could still have Reach falling for True. the entirety of the rest of the season sans like the second half of the last episode. We could have Reach falling and then keep cutting away to see all the other stuff that's going on. You know, we could have the initial wave of Covenant hitting civilian parts 
going into the next episode and then cut away for the second half of that episode to see what's going on with Ackerson. I hope that that's the case. I hope that we don't get just a one-off episode of The Fall of Reach. I hope it gets dragged out. I hope we get to see like an ongoing conflict. And then so, what What episode number was Onyx again? Onyx, I think, is six. Onyx is six. Okay. Because so, then Thermopylae is seven and then Halo. So we'll start getting the fall next week. And then maybe we see where Atkinson's going a little bit in the episode after that. And going into six, we actually get all of that while there's still waves of conflict happening on Reach. Like, I could see them jumping back and forth for the next couple episodes to really stretch out the fall of Reach. And then the characters we care about that aren't getting wiped out don't make it off until that last episode. That would be great. I I think, for lack of a better comparison, if they're basically able to pepper in a few Halo Reach uh, missions into the next few episodes instead of cramming it all in the next one, I'm all for that. I mean, at this point, I'm not quite expecting a parallel to the game missions, but I think no, they can sprinkle I, that's what I'm in saying. a lot like, of book just stuff from a general the sense. Like, they they if they're able to pepper in, you know, the the moments that makes the fall of reach the fall of reach, if they pepper it in over multiple episodes, like you said, is is what I would like instead of them doing the silver timeline version of the fall of reach in just one, you know, episode. Yeah, I don't. I don't think they're gonna give us a quick flash in the pan like that. Because if all right, think of it like this: What do we suspect is gonna happen if we get the fall of Reach in one episode and then still have half plus of the season left to go to kill before they get to just seeing a Halo at the end of the season? I mean, yeah, if I'd- we do get the Spartan threes. What, are we going to get shown the Spartan 3s after Reach already falls, and then they're going to replay the fall of Reach while we see what happened to the Spartan 3s after we know Reach already fell from a couple episodes ago? I just don't think it's going to happen like that. I think they're going to have to stretch it out and jump back and forth, sprinkle in the 3s, and then in those last couple of Reach fight scenes is when we get the 3s and see them get wiped out. I mean, the the ninth, or no, the seventh episode is Thermopylae, which sounds like a great final That was the, the stand of the 300 Spartans. Yeah. So that could, you know, that, that could be a great way to kind of conclude the fall of Reach sort of moment. And then the next Halo, next episode being Halo, it could then kind of start bringing us into what's coming next and stuff like that. So. What was the operation that took out one entire class of Spartan threes that it was just Tom and Lucy that came out of? Do you remember oh, the name gosh. of the operation? Yep. It was like, Oh man, I don't remember it, but yeah, it was, they were like targeting like a fueling rep- supply station or something. It was like, um, I, I, I think that's what's going to happen is we're going to get, the Spartan 3 is introduced real fast, and then we're going to get the equivalent of that operation where they just get introduced into the Fall of Reach and taken out that way just as quick, just to show that much more devastation on Reach. It's Operation Torpedo. Operation Torpedo was a UNSC operation to eliminate a covenant, covenant refinery on the inhabited moon Pagasi Delta. The engagement took place on July 3rd. The outcome was a UNSC victory, but a great loss. All participating Spartan 3s, with the exception of Tom and Lucy, were killed. However, all Covenant forces were grounded, as well as Covenant ships were eliminated. Yeah, I think I think we get that. We get the introduction of Spartan 3s. We get that, but on reach. And then we get the moment where... We think that did the trick, and no, that wasn't enough. There's a whole giant Covenant armada behind that, and that's what's going to actually finish off Reach. Yeah. All right, well, let's continue this conversation on the analysis episode and also talk about some of the other scenes that took place in this episode and talk about maybe some character moments and things. We still have yet to see Miranda Keys. I'm... Every every uh, every time I watch the episodes, I'm just like, yep, no Miranda. I'm curious what she's doing. 
Um, and no Cortana this episode. We got just a glimpse of her last episode, but she technically did not return this episode. So I'm, I have some theories about that and want to discuss those with you on the analysis episode. Before we wrap up, um, what were your overall opinions of, of Visegrad? Was it, uh, you know, quote unquote, bad episode? Was it just not great? Was it filler? What are your kind of general thoughts uh, about it? I think it was necessary filler, not done as well as it could have been, but we got through it and we got to the important part of the story that we've really been waiting for now. Um, it was, like I said, a little slower than we should have gotten there, I think, but it's not the end of the world. It could have been worse. It's not like season one all over again. So I'm happy with it. I'm content. I can accept this if I know there's going to be some real bangers coming behind it. And it looks like we're going to at least get some of that. Yeah, it definitely, I mean, the setup for the next episode is going to be huge. So it, it, I hope it has the right payoff and I have a feeling it will. Because the action sequences are usually all really good for the Halo show, um, I I agree that it there is some necessary filler in this episode, but I I just am disappointed that with a pretty good first episode and a pretty decent second episode that it was going to be able to kind of continue writing those coattails, and I feel like we've just been dipping like like one step so far as each episode kind of continues on and so i really hope that we not only get the action that we want because like you said not every episode can have the action and it is a character drama at the end of the day but i just think that there are some characterizations that just still need to be worked on like liera and Quan, and i hope soren we get some good things with him next episode like i'm not discounting anything since he's only been really in one episode but I, I want him to be more relevant. I, you know, I want to see what happens, what's up with Miranda, and I like what we're seeing with the Spartans. So, it's uh, it, the the potential is still there. I'm not completely lost, uh, but I was I was a bit disappointed. They definitely they didn't get away from the point. That's for sure. Yeah. So. Um. All right. Well, Steve, let's uh let's wrap things up, and then um, we'll get to our analysis episode and listeners you can you can listen to the analysis episode tomorrow if you're listening to this uh, on the day that it drops thank you for joining me steve absolutely halo the series premieres exclusively on paramount plus every thursday for the next six weeks or five weeks now Uh, if you're interested paramount plus also produces a halo after the show segment called halo the series declassified that releases with each tv episode this week for Visegrad, Sydney interviews Natasha McElholm, as well as uh, Joseph Morgan. They play Halsey and Ackerson, respectively. Uh, there's also conversation about the set design that went into creating the kind of area that Chief and Perengoski met in, in kind of that like downtown underbelly of uh, Reach, so to speak. And so they, they kind of talk about the set design into that some pretty interesting things as well as a very very tiny sneak peek for the next episode like i mentioned at the top of the show you can find every episode to all the other shows that evolved produces on our website evolvedhalo.com don't forget to check us out on social media facebook x instagram youtube tiktok and more again another special shout out to all of our patrons for supporting evolved and making all of our shows possible head over to patreon.com slash halo evolved to learn more If you like this show, please rate it or leave a review. We greatly appreciate all the feedback we get from the show to improve the quality of it for our listeners. And lastly, if you want to email us or leave us a voicemail to discuss this episode or a previous episode about the TV show, you can email us at podcastevolved at gmail.com or call us on our Google phone, which is 205-EVOLVED, which is 205-386-5833. And with that, I've been your host, Lauren, and until next time, evolve.